welcome everyone to this edition of the quantum marketplace webinar series on quantum timing. Um, this is a program that's um, proving to be extremely popular. We're delighted to be able to showcase several of the QEDC member companies, both on the um, provider side and some of the users of these technologies to um, give a, a, an update on what's available and um, where things are going. So I'm Celia Mertzbacher, Executive Director of the QEDC and um, very excited to be hearing from uh, our members today. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Mark Whippich. I just want to note that the Quantum Marketplace includes both these spotlight uh, webinars and we post information from them, the video information, both on our public site or on our member site and soon on our public site. We also include or are, are developing a searchable directory of information about the QEDC membership. So um, if you're not a member of QEDC, check it out on the public site. And if you're interested in knowing more about becoming a member of QEDC, feel free to contact me. So with that, I will turn it over to Mark Wibich. Great, thank you, Celia. So uh, I'm Mark Wibich. I'm gonna move right into it here. So let's... So just some uh, basic logistics and format. Uh, everyone is muted except the speakers. Uh, and the speakers should be quiet if they're not in a speaking form to make noise in the video. Uh, also, if you have a question, please use the chat window uh, so that we can you know, queue those questions up when we get to the panel discussion. And also the webinar will be recorded as Celia mentioned uh, and will be posted in the future in the quantum marketplace. So the agenda for today is, is we're gonna talk about uh, quantum timing trends just for a minute. Uh, and then we're gonna talk about the lineup. Uh, and then we're gonna jump into the various companies that are presenting today. Uh, and then also then we're gonna have an extended roundtable panel discussion at the end. And then we'll have a snapshot uh, of the webinar schedule that what we've done and what we plan to do going forward. So I thought it was appropriate to, um, this is by obviously not exhaustive, but uh, many entities and organizations have been working on, uh, you know, atomic clocks and next generation timing over the years. And it actually, it's, it, I find very curious that uh, there, was a, there was an article published in IEEE that they basically claimed that quantum supremacy, quantum timing supremacy was achieved in 1948 by the National Bureau of Standards which has become NIST. And with that, uh, I wanna get right into the lineup. So for today, we have John Kitching uh, from NIST to give an overview of atomic timing. And then we're gonna have uh, Tom from FEI and, and Mark from Stable Laser and Franklin from Spectra Dynamics. Uh, and those, those three will all talk about their position in the marketplace, which is providing either components or atomic uh, timing systems. And then we're gonna have uh, Chad from Honeywell and Tom from Lockheed Martin to give a user's perspective on what they're looking for in next generation timing. So with that, uh, let's, let's go with uh, John Kitchen. All right, thanks, Mark. Um, all right, is that showing up well? Yeah. You're good, John. Perfect. All right. So uh, yeah, Mark uh, asked me to just give a little bit of an introduction to uh, to atomic clocks to sort of set the stage for this um, this uh, quantum marketplace uh, event. Um, uh, I am a group leader and fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the Time and Frequency Division. Um, so uh, this up here in the left hand corner is a picture of um, a of uh, the NIST F1 primary atomic frequency standard, and this. Um, was it in its time one of the most accurate clocks in the world? As you may know, uh, time is the most accurately measured physical quantity. Um, and in fact, clocks now are achieving uh, frequency uncertainties in the range of 10 to the minus 18 now, which is uh, truly amazing. Um, this um, basically means that you can uh, maintain uh, timing uh, error better than one nanosecond for basically as long as you want. Um, and further improvements are still uh, developing, I would say, in this, era, in this area. 
Um, the basis of these clocks is the idea that uh, because of quantum mechanics, uh, there are fixed energy levels in, in atomic systems. And so an atom is a very, very simple atomic system. It has a, a nucleus and, uh, at least for alkali atoms, a single valence electron. And the energy level structure is all determined by fundamental constants of nature. And so that's why um, you know, every atom is, if it's isolated well enough, is basically the same. And so if you build a clock based on rubidium uh, here or in Europe or wherever, uh, the, the, the frequencies that you get are, are basically exactly the same. So, and this is part of the reason why um, the SI second now is defined in terms of transitions in, uh, between uh, various energy levels in atomic systems. So the main um, way that we characterize clocks is through something called the Allen deviation. Uh, and um, you'll probably hear uh, or see some Allen deviations presented uh, during the next hour or so. Uh, typically, uh, the Allen deviation is just basically the fractional frequency instability of the clock for some averaging time tau. And so that basically means that if you wait some time tau, this Allen deviation will give you the fractional frequency error that you would get uh, in, in measuring that frequency. And so um, typically these Allen deviations look something like this plot here. You have a white noise component at short integration times, which integrates down, um, uh, that allows you to measure the frequency more precisely. And then usually some forms of environmental noise kick in at some point, uh, maybe in the range of you know, a few thousands of seconds or something. And then uh, drift will typically take over at very long integration times. Um, and uh, will limit the stability. And so typical clocks have something like this. Some clocks uh, can integrate down um, almost perfectly um, for, uh, for however long you want, but most clocks look something like this. And you can basically um, translate this kind of Allen deviation into a timing error, which is what is needed for a lot of applications. If you're trying to time something precisely, then, um, uh, then you need to know essentially the timing error and uh, and there's a little bit more that goes into this, things like accuracy and, and, and things. So, but, but nevertheless, you can just see that from this Allen deviation, you can uh, calculate a timing error and you can see that the timing error is increasing in time. Uh, if you want to time something at a thousand seconds, you, know, you might be able to get a nanosecond of error. Um, and uh, for this particular type of, of clock, you know, if you want to time something over a week, then it might be much larger than that. And there's a number of other um, elements in clocks that, that are important, things like retrace, uh, of course, swap C, uh, yeah, accuracy, and other things like that. So when I started in this business about uh, 20 years ago, um, there were basically three types of clocks that were available. There were vapor cell clocks uh, based on um, thermal vapors of atoms confined in glass vapor cells. There were uh, cesium beam clocks that were based on beams of atoms, cesium, and these were really the workhorse for accurate timing. And finally, there were hydrogen masers that um, are used that were used for uh, for very precise timing. And you can see here vapor cell clocks. They're small, uh, low power, but um, they uh, and, and low cost. Uh, but their their uh, Allen deviations are worse than other types of clocks such as cesium beams and hydrogen masers. Over the last 20 years, there's been a number of developments that, that uh, have, um, uh, have uh, emerged and are now uh, really allowing uh, more capability. Uh, we now have chip scale clocks that can basically run on a battery. Um, uh, of course, they're not as stable as, as other things, but because they can run on a battery, they're important for a lot of applications. We now have commercial clocks based on laser cooled atoms um, that uh, are now uh, you know, increasing in terms of accuracy. We have ion clocks that are being developed for space applications and that could um, uh, be important in next generation GPS systems. And I think most importantly, we have this new generation of optical clocks, which are based on laser frequencies, not microwaves. And these are now achieving these spectacularly high levels of stability and accuracy at the level of 10 to the minus 18. Um, here is a picture of one of these, por a portable version of these that uh, you can see that was built in Japan a, a couple of years ago. And so these are kind of the new developments, I would say, and uh, kind of really the things that are really pushing the, um, uh, that the will be, be very important, I think, in the future uh, as uh, timing uh, needs uh, increase. So with that, I will uh, end and uh, turn it over to the next speaker. Great, thank you, John. Let's get Tom up from FBI. Okay. Can you see my screen and hear yeah, me? Hopefully, need to, need to switch your display settings. Um, 
at the top of the screen, you need to swap displays. Top left, take your mouse to top left. See where it says show taskbar and it says display settings. Left, go left. Yeah, display settings, one over. Not that one, yeah, that one. Swap, yep, swap. Perfect. All right, go ahead, Tom. Okay, so I'm Tom McClellan from Frequency Electronics. Uh, we're in the business of uh, precision, time, and frequency. I'll tell you a little bit uh, about uh, FEI, as we're known, over the next couple of uh, minutes. So just a brief uh, introduction. We've been around for 55 years, quite a while. We're a small business. We're, uh, we produce quartz and rubidium precision time and frequency uh, devices. We like to think of our specialty as taking uh, technology from the laboratory, things that are demonstrated in the laboratory, and making uh, practical products that can be used in the field, primarily in uh, military and space uh, applications. Uh, we have a lot of technical expertise in-house and a pretty robust uh, R&D program internally and that's what uh, feeds the uh, product uh, development. Uh, a snapshot of the company. Many people probably haven't heard of Frequency Electronics, but we were founded in 1961. So we've been around for a while. We, uh, we have about 150 employees. That qualifies us by government definitions as a small business but uh, it's a little bit more than our garage shop with just uh, one or two employees. Uh, we have 100,000 square feet of laboratory space at our main facility on Long Island, and we have a couple of sub uh, subsidiaries, uh, one in California and one in uh, New Jersey. Uh, we have, uh, for fiscal year 20, 2020, our last fiscal year, we had revenues of 41.5 million. So we uh, uh, we like to think of ourselves uh, uh, an important uh, aspect of the way we do business is we're a, a vertically integrated uh, company that we feel is very important for the type of technology that we deal in. Uh, is, as uh, John introduced, it's precision clocks and uh, you know, it's very, in order to get the kind of performance that uh, people are looking for in these things, uh, everything needs to be done uh, correctly. So it's important to uh, have a lot of uh, uh, control over the raw material from the raw materials to the finished product. So uh, we, we uh, for the technologies that we deal in, we, uh, we try to control as much as we possibly can. So for instance, quartz oscillators, we manufacture the quartz resonators in our own facility. We control all of the processing, and we finish with uh, quartz oscillators that go into larger systems. For rubidium atomic clocks, we start with uh, literally with uh, uh, isotopes of uh, rubidium, and uh, we produce all of the cells, the vapor cells that those go into, and the finished uh, atomic clocks. So, so the next couple of slides, I'd like to sort of walk through uh, FEI's history. And uh, the starting is not the first thing that FEI did, but it's kind of a key thing. Back in 1977, we manufactured uh, quartz oscillators for the Voyager spacecraft, which were actually launched in uh, 1977. And uh, they're still out there uh, working at this point in time. The quartz oscillator that we manufactured for Voyager 1 uh, stopped operating a few years ago, but it had a lifetime of 34 years uh, in space, and the Voyager 2 quartz oscillator continues to function to this day, so it's over uh, 40 years at this point in time. So that kind of uh, gives a, a little bit of flavor the, the kind of reliability that can be had from these things and, uh, and how long uh, FEI has been uh, contributing. 
Uh, the next thing, we're going to flash forward from 1977 to 2013, uh, pretty close uh, to the present by comparison. And uh, we're just showing uh, contributions that we made to the Iridium Next satellite uh, system. And uh, the thing we want to emphasize here is that for a space system, uh, this is relatively large quantity. So the Voyager satellite, we produced uh, two oscillators. Uh, in this case, we, uh, we produced a whole lot of devices. The Iridium system is a satellite constellation of 66 active low Earth orbit satellites. So uh, some of the, the uh, parts that we did for this we had over 2,500 uh, assemblies that needed to be manufactured. So we go from a very custom, one-off kind of production to a relatively large uh, uh, manufacturing capability. Going on to 2014, a year later, we uh, delivered to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, ultra-stable quartz oscillators that are used as uh, a key part of the deep space atomic clock, which uh, just got launched and actually is still uh, operating in orbit uh, at this point in time. These oscillators produce pretty much state-of-the-art uh, performance in terms of Allen deviation for quartz oscillators. We're down in the 10 to the 14 range uh, at averaging times of, of about uh, 10 seconds. Uh, we move on next uh, to 2015, and uh, we developed at that point in time what we call a digital rubidium atomic frequency standard. This is developed for the GPS uh, satellite system. This is a very uh, high precision vapor cell rubidium atomic clock. Um, we introduced some uh, digital control electronics uh, for this device. And this is just starting to come online right now. Literally within the next couple of days, we should be starting qualification testing of, uh, of uh, the qual model for this, uh, this unit. And now we, we move on to the current time and uh, technology that's under development at FEI. This one we're kind of uh, uh, proud of. This the so-called pulsed optically pump or pop rubidium vapor atomic clock. And this is still a vapor cell atomic clock, but by using a pulsed uh, laser as a light source, we, uh, we can get roughly an order of magnitude improvement in performance. So this is still a vapor cell clock, and as John Kitching uh, stated, uh, this has a limited stability capabilities. But the key nice thing about that is it's a proven technology that's been fielded. There are thousands of vapor cell atomic clocks out there. So by making a, a very small change to the design of this, we can get a, a big improvement in the performance. So this is, this is kind of a, a middle ground of a very high performance atomic clock but we know that we can make it in the small packaging, in the uh, vibration-resistant packages, et cetera, that are, are ideal for a lot of applications that are, people are looking for at this point in time. We're also working directly with uh, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to actually manufacture in, in volume their mercury ion atomic clock we talked a few slides back about the deep space atomic clock. That's a mercury ion clock. And uh, we are, are actively working at this point in time to uh, bring that technology, to manufacture that technology. Um, this is kind of a, a step beyond the, uh, the pulsed optically pumped, pumped uh, vapor cell clock because it's uh, stored ions that are isolated uh, very well from the environment, we expect uh, much better long-term uh, stability from this kind of uh, technology. And finally, uh, we, we uh, looking to the future, 
we're uh, uh, actively working uh, on uh, clock ensembling. The idea here is that uh, we, we, instead of trying to make one better clock, we combine the uh, performance from uh, multiple clocks in order to get uh, a better measure of time and frequency. Uh, we're also looking toward advanced optical atomic clocks, as John kind of described in his uh, presentation. Uh, we have a lot of interest in photonic oscillators, that, uh, primarily uh, looking at improved uh, phase noise. And uh, we're also interested in uh, quantum computing. So finally, uh, that's about it. Uh, the last slide just gives uh, some contacts uh, if uh, anybody is uh, interested in uh, working with us in any way. Here's how to get a hold of us. Great. That's it. Mm -hmm. Mark? Yeah, thanks, Tom. So uh, let's go next, uh, Mark Nutcutt. Is this still working? Yeah. Excellent. So uh, my name is Mark Nutcutt and I'm from Stable Laser Systems and we're a 15 person, uh, 12 year old company in Boulder, Colorado. We sell uh, complete uh, frequency stabilized systems such as uh, clock lasers at the, uh, so with Allen deviations in the 10 to minus 16s and 10 to minus 15s. Uh, general spectroscopy lasers for cooling and uh, atom manipulation. Uh, 15, 50 nanometer stabilized lasers at the Hertz level for general metro metrology. And these uh, have uh, very long lock times in uh, non-lab environments, such as uh, some shacks. Uh, we also sell uh, just fabric per cavities with custom coatings that you can use as reference cavities or for spectroscopy. I'm not sure if you can see the, the beautiful multiball cavity on the bottom right. And that you can use to stabilize uh, just a bunch of lasers and then lastly, um, filter cavities, which you would use to filter laser noise or filter frequency combs. Okay, so the, um, pardon. the uh, picture on the left here shows a, a complete uh, clock laser system. And I guess, uh, let me just apologize right away that it's not in a sort of a 40 centimeter by 40 centimeter box with uh, nice heat sinks all over it. But anyway, um, this system is a, a 1542 nanometer laser uh, distribution laser, which is stabilized at the Hertz level. And then a clock laser, which is, uh, has the same uh, frequency stability. And that is transferred through a frequency comb. And the clock laser has fiber noise cancellation so that it can be delivered to the, um, you know what I mean, the physics cell. Um, also, there is a, um, uh, 10 and 100 megahertz uh, RF uh, outputs from the comb, divided down from the comb with uh, one of Franklin Askerantz's uh, dividers. So all our, um, all our hardware is generally based on FPGA, um, you know, control. And um, this enables, uh, you know, great features that um, not just, uh, you know, very low offset locking, but it means that you have wonderful remote control capabilities, wonderful uh, you know, on the fly setting of uh, parameters. And also it is uh, sending back, it's pushing data back to the user so that they can monitor the system health. You know, they can see when actuators are going close to the rail, if uh, some temperature you know, is in the lab is getting too high. So it, you know, it's, it's kind of a step towards a, a very independent system. Um, I just want to say that in this case, the, uh, we do a lot of offset locks, and in this case, the clock laser can be moved around um, in frequency, you know, through the programming a DDS word, and this allows you to, um, the user, to program the, uh, the uh, frequency steps that you need uh, to drive a, a clock transition to generate an error signal. Okay, and then look, I've... I just showed you a little square wave on the on the right there, 200 hertz. But uh, you can do many different things with uh, the command set. Okay, 
And then uh, next, so the uh, for fiber noise cancellation systems, you know, this is uh, commonly used in, in laboratories. Uh, so stable laser system sells both complete systems, or you can just buy the uh, control electronics. And, you know, if you a uh, lab user, you may just want to control electronics and you can set up your own interferometer or move it from, you know, one experiment to another as you need to in, in time. So this uh, idea was developed at uh, NIST and Jilla, and it um, is essentially a phase stabilized Michelson interferometer with the AOM providing the feedback. Uh, the feedback is of course in frequency, but nonetheless, this allows the uh, re remote delivery um, of uh, frequency, stable frequency to a reflector somewhere in your system. Uh, you can also use this, this box just as a, a digital phase lock box. And um, it, you know, has all these uh, uh, sort of flexible menu options. You can drive AOMs uh, of different frequencies. Uh, you can set all the PI parameters. You can set the output power. You get a status output. You get remote control. And also because there's an AOM in the system, if you provide a, a photo detector signal, you also get a, you know, a optical power control. And in the graph there, you know, uh, I'm not exactly sure what's limiting that. It's probably the reference arm of the interferometer, but you can see it starts at 10 to the minus 16 and uh, works its way, its way downwards in the L, in the L and deviation. So um, if you need to travel much further than one fiber link, and that's a you know, slightly more complex discussion, but you can set up a repeater station uh, to regenerate a, a very narrow wave for onward transmission. And the way to do this, or one way you can do this, is with a st stable laser system's one hertz offset locked uh, stabilized laser. So the um, the laser is not directly stabilized itself on the cavity transmission. It's sort of uh, it's, you can uh, set the operational frequency through a DDS word, and this means that you can regenerate the incoming light. The incoming light may be degraded in its uh, optical spectrum because of the phase noise imparted by the previous fiber link. And so you may just want to lock your regeneration laser with a few hertz, um, you know, phase lock loop. And uh, this is ideally suited to the digital electronics that, that's in this box. So you can, you know, accurately regenerate the source phase and frequency for onward uh, transmission. Okay, and again, you know, you have full uh, remote control. You can um, have this uh, unit out in a shack and you can sit at your desk sipping tea. All right, and so I'm just gonna summarize there and saying we sell a lot of uh, great hardware um, that you can use uh, to form flexible solutions for your timing distribution needs. And you know, with SLS, it's just hurt so good. All right, thank you. Great, thanks, Mark. Let's roll right into Franklin with SDI. Great. Go ahead, Franklin. Yep. Oh, my name's uh, Franklin Askerums. I'm the president of Spectra Dynamics, a company located in Louisville, Colorado. Spectra Dynamics has manufactured low noise instrumentation for time, frequency, and now uh, quantum applications. Uh, we've been doing this for the past 27 years. We manufacture a variety of products that can be used for quantum timing applications. We offer a cold rubidium atomic clock, we have a variety of high-speed pulse and clock distribution amplifiers, and some of our RF frequency distribution amplifiers work up to uh, one gigahertz in frequency. We also offer microsteppers that have femtosecond time resolution for reference signals of 5, 10, and 100 megahertz. Our line of specialty microwave synthesizers may be used in atomic clock and quantum sensor applications. We have several of these synthesizers running in cold atomic fountain frequency standards around the globe. For the folks working on optical clocks, we have developed optical pulse to RF converters for an assortment of repetition rates.
one of our newest products is a cold rubidium atomic clock that was funded by DARPA. The original DARPA specifications called for a clock with a short-term frequency instability of less than a part in 10 to the minus 12 at one second averaging time, and a long-term frequency instability of less than five parts in 10 to the minus 15. Our technical approach was to develop a laser-cooled rubidium microwave clock. The clock has a microwave synthesizer, a very compact laser system, and a high performance physics package. The clock cycle is shown in the cartoon. The rubidium atom, 87 atoms are trapped and cooled at the top of the physics package. Optical pumping is, is then used to get the atoms into the proper ground state. The light is turned off to allow the atoms to fall through the microwave cavity and interact with the microwave field. The atoms then enter a detection region where the atoms that made the clock transition are detected. And then this detection signal is used to lock a low noise oscillator to the atomic transition. This uh, cold rubidium atomic clock is now a commercially available product. We have shipped several devices this year. It comes in a 40 liter, 30 kilogram enclosure. The power consumption is about 75 watts and it runs on 100 to 240 volts AC, as well as 24 volts DC. The switchover from AC to DC operation is automatic, so as to ensure continuous operation. The clock has outputs at all the standard uh, timing outputs, one pulse per second, five, 10, and 100 megahertz. On the right, is the total Allen deviation data for five of our production clocks. The frequency and stability of the clock can be characterized as less than eight parts in 10 to minus 13 over root tau from one to about 100,000 seconds. Or averaging times greater than 10 days, the frequency and stability is less than one part in 10 to minus 15. And this corresponds to a time deviation less than 100 picoseconds at one day. Um, over a period of 30 days, the clock has no long-term drift. We're still evaluating uh, longer averaging times. We also manufacture uh, the FC series of optical to microwave synthesizer modules. And uh, these were developed for use in optical clocks or photonic oscillators. The instrument is used to generate low noise, ultra stable, one pulse per second, 10 megahertz and 100 megahertz signals that derive their phase and frequency stability from a pulsed optical source. We have modules that operate at 80, 160, 200, and 250 megahertz optical pulse repetition rates. On the right side, you can see a plot of typical stability data. Uh, this is a common source Allen deviation for a pair of devices. And you can see that it's about eight parts in 10 to minus 15 at one second averaging time. And then the ADEP at 1,000 seconds is less than five parts in 10 to minus 17. We're looking to expand our customer base. Uh, so we're looking for new customers. We're also looking for partners for new projects and applications. We are expanding and have open positions for atomic physicists and as well as some senior uh, electrical engineers or mechanical engineers. We'd like to find new suppliers that offer laser system and optical components, as well as uh, people that can provide optical coding services. If you can help us or are interested, uh, please send us an email or a call. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with all, all of you. Thanks, Franklin. So, Tom, are you ready to go? Yep, no problem. Okay. Uh, so, my name is Tom Loftus, and I'm a Lockheed Martin Associate Fellow and the Quantum Strategic Technical Advisor for one of the four Lockheed Martin business areas. Um, I have a background in precision measurements, optical atomic clocks, and atom interferometers. Uh, precise timing is critical to the U.S. military and enables a broad range of warfighting capabilities, including radio communications, network synchronization, sensor fusion, information gathering, weapons delivery, electronic warfare, and all types of sensors. 
It's very widely known that the uh, GPS system provides precise position capabilities for military and civilian navigation devices. It's less widely discussed, but no less important that GPS also provides uh, provides precise timing. Um, it provides uh, those capabilities under normal conditions, but the low power signals from GPS satellites are vulnerable to interference or jamming. Uh, many of you, in fact, may have heard of the example of a commercial truck driver who inadvertently jammed GPS at the Newark Airport in New Jersey with a device that costs less than $100 and you know, that he was using to prevent his company from tracking his position throughout the day. Um, more generally, in recognizing the U.S. reliance on GPS, potential adversaries are developing and using increasingly capable jammers and spoofers to deny the use of uh, GPS to U.S. military forces. Uh, GPS satellites are also high value and small quantity assets that are vulnerable to physical attacks uh, from ground-based and other anti-satellite weapons. And as you might guess, uh, disruption or denial of GPS can create uh, extremely significant challenges for military units in combat, making it difficult to conduct coordinated maneuvers, accurately fire weapons, or have an accurate understanding of force deployment. Um, military units may also lack GPS signals in environments such as dense urban areas where clear and of sight to GPS satellites is impossible. And, um, you know, more generally spoofing attacks can also cause U.S. forces to fire weapons in unintended directions or at incorrect times. Uh, so given the situation, there's a very clear need for portable atomic clocks that provide GPS quality timing over you know, mission relevant durations and inform factors that enable deployment across many platforms with, as you might guess, uh, clocks having minimized size, weight, and power providing the largest potential impact. Um, in a more uh, generic sense, some missions may require extremely low power consumption and very small system footprints, while others require higher levels of precision that are more tolerant to system size. In some cases, you need GPS holdover of a few days, uh, whereas in other cases, many months are required to be um, to provide the sort of enabling capability that's required for the mission. Uh, as you might, uh, you know, or as maybe this audience already knows, there's a number of challenges that need to be overcome uh, to attain all of these goals. Um, uh, one of the biggest drivers, of course, is cost. Um, transitioning what are often artisan devices into volume production, retaining performance over military uh, relevant thermal shock and vibration environments, and then achieving mean time to failure of many years and so on. And uh, there's been a lot of, uh, you know, very impressive progress in this area, I think in the last decade in particular. And, uh, you know, a great example of the kind of progress that needs to be made is provided by the CSAC clocks, which are uh, roughly the size of a matchbox, consume around 100 milliwatts of power, cost only $1,500, and provide GPS grade uh, time for orders of magnitude longer than any alternative in the same size and footprint. Uh, that, that's all I had, Mark. Okay, thanks, Tom. So, Chad, you ready? Uh, you're going to have to swap displays, Chad. Okay, great. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, so I'm Chad Ferding. I'm a quantum scientist at uh, Honeywell Aerospace Advanced and Applied Technology. Uh, Honeywell is a world leader in control and navigation systems for land, air, and space applications from fiber optic uh, ring uh, to ring laser gyroscopes to embedded navigators uh, that integrate inertial sensing and GPS together to customize electronics uh, that work in high temperature or high radiation environments. Um, Honeywell technology is really found on, on nearly every aircraft and, and nearly every NASA mission flying today. Uh, over the last few decades, uh, we've tapped into this legacy of rugged and reliable electronic and optical instrument uh, building to develop uh, a pretty broad and deep portfolio of innovative components, uh, including MEMS, uh, photonics, um, and uh, electronics uh, that are at the heart of our next generation miniature atomic clock technology that we're developing. 
We see a broad application space for low swap, environmentally rugged uh, atomic clocks to provide resilient timing uh, in such uh, places as communication networks, uh, critical infrastructure, small sats, autonomous cars, urban air mobility, and also DOD communications and navigation needs. To bring into relief the capability gap that next-gen atomic timing modules are going to need to fill, um, here we study a realistic use case of two aircraft that are relying on internal autonomous timing to maintain a secure communications channel over a mission of about three hours in a completely GPS-denied theater. So using published specifications for a wide variety of uh, currently available tactical clocks, uh, we simulate the worst case time loss uh, after an initial uh, synchronization. And we find in all cases that the time loss uh, at the uh, middle or end of the mission exceeds the 500 nanosecond threshold that's uh, required by some of the most uh, important and widespread um, secure comms protocols. So to achieve widespread adoption in demanding applications like this, the next gen atomic clocks have to have excellent holdover in uh, harsh environments uh, with better accuracy than current state of the art allows. The components that are required to build the next gen tactical atomic clocks similarly have to be engineered not only for extremely low swap and low cost, but also environmental robustness uh, and have a pathway to manufacturing at scale. So examples of some of those components uh, that are particularly relevant to the atomic clock technology that we're developing are a narrow line with diode lasers that can operate for long lifetimes at elevated temperatures, uh, integrated photonics uh, for space efficient uh, optical functionalities, miniature form factor optical components like isolators, modulators, and shutters, G insensitive crystal oscillators, miniature ultra high vacuum pumps, and devices to source uh, atomic vapor uh, at temperature. Um, and Honeywell is always interested in talking to new innovators uh, of these and other uh, re related technologies. And so thanks for listening uh, and uh, reach out to aerospace.honeywell.com to learn more. Great, great. Thanks, Chad. Sure. So we're gonna go back to sharing my screen now. All right. So, so now for all the speakers, uh, and then if anybody has a question, please post it in the chat. Um, you know, <clears throat> like to jump right in and you know I think Chad you Tom and Chad sort of kick this off of, of you know what's going on and in, in driving next generation deployed atomic clocks what I did here is I separated uh, you know sort of terrestrial in building on the ground not moving uh, and then you know vehicles and that can be you know someone moving around in a, with something in a backpack or it's in a car or an autonomous vehicle to aircraft, this could be commercial aircraft, fighter aircraft, as, as uh, Chad just talked about, or also as uh, in satellites, which which uh, Tom talked about earlier from FEI, and and also uh, you know I'm not saying that Lockheed didn't talk about that as well. So also just to, I don't really want to get into it too much, but I put a snapshot of the market, the existing market today for timekeeping. Uh, overall is, is estimated, uh, you know, via various sources of about 5.7 billion, uh, you know, and then breaking that down into precision timing versus, you know, just timing devices. And, you know, atomic clocks still make up a smaller portion of the overall worldwide timekeeping market, but it is getting more and more important. Uh, you know, so I, I sort of want, I want to ask the panel here of the speakers that, that, that have spoken so far in the webinar, um, you know, what are some of the largest markets driving next generation atomic clocks, you know, from a deployed perspective? Anybody have an opinion on that? Uh, you want to you wanna go first, Tom from FEI? Sure. Um, I, uh, I think uh, we, uh, we should definitely hear from uh, the, the users because uh, because they're probably the most important voices on this. But uh, uh, I think from our point of view, we, uh, we see a lot of uh, space applications in particular. Uh, we, we see uh, low Earth orbit satellite systems. 
and uh, a lot of kind of interesting uh, applications there and uh, a lot of ideas for uh, alternatives to GPS. That seems to be a big thing that we hear about is uh, providing timing, uh, position, navigation, and timing in uh, w without using GPS, so so-called GPS denied uh, environments. And uh, there are a lot of ideas with low Earth orbit satellites. I think one of the things we see that becomes very important is uh, uh, making devices that can work in that kind of an environment and other similar environments, so uh, compact, small, low cost, uh, but precision uh, timing. So somehow there's a sweet spot between the ultimate and performance, which maybe takes up a whole uh, room in a laboratory, and uh, the chip scale atomic clock at the other end of the spectrum, which uh, you know uh, is, is very small, compact, and uh, low power dissipation, but uh, doesn't have such great performance. So uh, I. Everybody would like to have uh, something that performs like the uh, the NIST uh, uh, standards in the laboratory, but it's the size of the chip scale atomic clock. So somehow we we, we see as our goal trying to uh, meet the ideal compromise uh, between the two ends of the spectrum. Okay, great. So, so you you mentioned GPS denied. That seems to be one of the uh, biggest uh, discussion points. Uh, there's there's others as well. So I, I took the liberty and actually um, put this slide together, and I want to ask the panel this as well. You know, what what are some of the largest market segments driving next generation atomic clocks for GPS denied environments or GPS denied? Uh, you know, and I'm highlighting buildings and, and moving around on the ground and, you know, aircraft, maybe not so much satellite because that's where the GPS comes from. Um, but Tom, do you want to expand on this a bit? I mean, excuse me, Chad from Honeywell, do you want to expand on this a bit? How you see this? On mute, sure. Um, so I, I think one thing to recognize is that um, the, the next biggest markets for um, autonomous timing are going to be the systems that already require uh, good timing, but get it uh, sometimes without knowing from uh, embedded uh, GPS systems that are there to provide positioning, but also are incidentally providing extremely reliable and, and precise and accurate time to the systems. Uh, I think system designers have become uh, a bit complacent in assuming that um, accurate time is always available uh, through the GPS network, uh, uh, and you know, if when you talk to people about uh, what if GPS goes out, I think everybody agrees it's that's bad uh, when they reflect on it for a few moments. But the systems aren't yet accepting uh, their own autonomous timing uh, uh, to to either switch over or hold over. Uh, so I think that the emergence of the newest, the new big markets is really just happening uh, as people become more cognizant of the threat of GPS outage to uh, the implicitly uh, assumed existence of assured timing in their systems. Uh, so I, I think in the next five years, we're going to see, and it could be one or more of the figures you have on your screen, uh, but right now I'd say it's not 100% clear uh, which uh, of these or, or other sectors will um, uh, fully jump in with both feet, recognizing that uh, these platforms need to have atomic timing uh, to operate through uh, GPS uh, denied um, theaters. Great, great. Thanks, Chad. So Tom from Lockheed, do you want to comment on, on, on that as well? Yeah, I mean, you know, certainly the DOD is a large potential market. And um, I think one of the other speakers was talking about trying to find the sort of ultimate compromise between performance and cost and swap and so on. And the one thing I might add to that is that there, there is no sort of unicorn solution, I think, um, in the, or that you don't actually need to do that in the sense that some missions, you know, can get by with a lower grade timing, but are more swap focused, whereas others, you know, can handle the larger infrastructure and so on that's re required to really support, um, you know, best in class performance. So I think it's a maybe a, a more open uh, space in terms of 
um, what you can design to and so on. So some, some questions that are coming in the chat in terms of the market size for these next generation clocks, any ideas or any, any insight that you and Chad can, can offer? I mean, the, you know, uh, GPS grade timing is used everywhere in the US military. So, and, you know, having that sort of defining capability of being able to get by without it, but still have all the functions that are supported by GPS is, you know, um, pretty obviously hugely enabling. So if you are able to, you know, deploy systems that can support that, I think it would be a, you know, a large market. Yeah, I, I have to agree. Um, I think the the challenge is marrying the different uh, performance echelons and, and cost echelons with, with those customers. I think everybody would buy an, uh, an awesome clock if it, if it was the size of a, of a nickel and cost a nickel as well. Um, but, um, you know, people have developed systems that uh, function on the timing available today. Uh, and in many cases, that's GPS. When you add in uh, autonomous uh, local atomic timing, uh, it, it costs that system money um, and their customers uh, have to have a willingness to pay for that. So maybe again, spiraling back to my earlier comment as people's awareness, and, and it is in, in, it's certainly uh, being towed along by, by the DOD consciousness of the risks to GPS, um, as people's awareness about the lost, uh, the, the value proposition for keeping your systems up uh, uh, in, uh, when GPS uh, degraded or, or denied events become more prevalent, uh, that'll start be starting to be worth something to, to the systems customers. Uh, and until all that sorts itself out, I think it's hard to know, uh, you know where the biggest market will be or what those clocks will look like. Right, but it is, it is safe to assume that, uh, well, what we're hearing from, from both of you is that, is that what, what you guys are talking about in these use cases, these are big problems they, they're problems that are, you know, real problems that need aspirin. And this is not selling vitamins now. You, you, you have a real problem that needs to be solved. And what I'm hearing or what we're hearing here is, is, that, is that these clocks now are, what, a new market that, that atomic clock makers would make into? I mean, they, they, are they supplying into this market today and it's just not good enough? Or is this just because GPS denied is becoming potentially a bigger problem? Is that going to generate, in your opinion, uh, new markets? Or, or how, what would you say about that? I mean, I can respond uh, that I, I think absolutely there will be both new markets and expansion in the current markets where current, GPS, uh, current atomic clocks are being sold. But the applications that are going to drive those uh, this, the systems in which these clocks are critical modules um, haven't been designed yet. Uh, and so uh, that's, so, so I'm not, I'm, I'm hedging in a sense is, to, you know, what's the next market? I, I don't know. It depends on who gets their, you know, which customer gets there first, but I think there will be brand new markets and also a pretty significant ex expansion in the markets that are currently serviced by current state-of-the-art clocks. Yeah, and I yeah. think it, you know, it's important to keep in mind one of the barriers to entry there is that the DOD is very risk averse. And so um, achieving, you know, uh, building hardware of sufficient maturity and that, you know, has the, um, can perform over the variety of environments and things uh, while maintaining that reliability is also very key. So, so thank you. So from a time horizon perspective, is this something that's near term or is this something that's further out? I think there's components of both, honestly. Um, okay. Great. I, I want to uh, jump forward and then back a little bit. There was a presentation um, that was organized by NPL in the UK, uh, where the CEO of the London Stock Exchange actually quoted publicly um, that that uh, a, a GNSS outage would be, you know, it would cost it would cost over a billion pounds a day. Right. So one of the one of the conversations, uh, you know, sort of from the user side is is talking about, um, you know, having GPS hold over on the ground. And you both had mentioned, you know, that, you know, life essentially is over relying on that. And if it, it, it can be denied and it can be jammed and it can go down. And so, you know, they've calculated, I think some others have 
put in the chat as well, but they've calculated that it's over a billion pounds a day. Um, you know, so these, these would be terrestrial clocks on the ground, not necessarily moving around. Um, and so I wanna, I wanna uh, go to Franklin um, because you have a cold atom rubidium clock that can sit in a building that's fairly accurate, right? They're talking about they want nanoseconds of, of you know, accuracy for doing high, high speed trading. Any, any comments in terms of how your clock or other clocks would fare in that environment? Well, I think that uh, the clock that, that we're manufacturing now could address uh, that, you know, this, this problem on the ground in a, in a quiet environment. Um, the clock that we make is, you know, it's not intended to fly or be turned upside down. Uh, but it, it could address some of these uh, needs, uh, such as, you know, the one you just pointed out in your slide. That's on one hand. On the other hand, um, it's been my experience that uh, people don't buy clocks until they actually need them. And I don't think until there is, you know, some kind of crisis where people actually lose a billion pounds a day, uh, that people will decide, oh, okay, now it's time to upgrade our infrastructure. And, you know, that might be a little bit cynical, but um, uh, I think that's the way it works in the real world. Yeah. Yeah, so there's definitely you know a, a bit of that going on, but but there are there is more and more funding now uh, that we're hearing that is going into these terrestrial clocks for holdover. Um, so I want to quickly go now, you know, to and then we can come back to some more of the questions in the chat. But you know, what are uh, to the whole uh, to the whole panel here? What are some of the leading technology approaches for? doing, you know, handling this GNSS denied, GPS denied environments. You know, I've listed a few here. This is not an exhaustive list, but, you know, are these, you know, and sort of Tom from FEI alluded to what is the sweet spot, you know, for some of these use cases, right? You know, uh, should we be looking at atomic clocks, you know, based on rubidium, you know, pop clocks as FEI and others are working on? Should we be looking at ion clocks like FEI is working on, laser cooled, which others are working on? Uh, other, did I miss something? Um, you know, uh, Franklin, I, I, it'd be great to get your perspective on this first. Okay. Um, well, I, th I, th I think uh, probably most of these technologies uh, have their, their application where, where they would perform and be the, the ideal, you know, solution. Um, just an, as an example, I'll throw, I'll throw this out. Uh, the ion clock would probably be good for airborne applications, space applications. Uh, you know, it's robust. It, I think it's a robust technology if, if they can get the lamp working. Um, and it would be a general purpose, I think, clock for uh, dynamic environments. Um, the other laser, I mean, the other technologies listed on your slide all require a laser system. Uh, I think once uh, the, you know, the, the, there's, give it another 10 years and we'll have reliable laser systems that you can maybe put on a chip and those clocks will now become uh, more of a reality. As far as laser cool clocks, you know, we, we have one that we're commercially manufacturing now, uh, but I can tell you it's large, it consumes a lot of power, and, you know, we, we have a three-year warranty and not a seven or ten-year warranty. So I think, uh, in my honest opinion, is that all of these technologies, uh, some of these technologies will compete against each other uh, for, for a given market, but um, I think if you take each one separately, as you have listed on your slide, they can all probably find an application today where 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 you can have a direct application and and market your clock, whether it be a pool or a pop clock or an iron clock or a laser pool uh, microwave clock. Okay, and then and then thank you, Franklin, and then Tom from FBI, um, since you're making some of these clocks, uh, what do you think? Well, I uh, let me just say right from the start, I think I agree with uh, Franklin. 
uh, there's a place for all of these things. I, uh, one thing I want to emphasize, uh, we talked earlier about this sweet spot, and yeah. uh, I think I agree with the comment that uh, there's a different sweet spot for every application. There are a lot of different applications, and they have a variety of different needs and different uh, environments that they have to work in. So, you know, what works really well on a LEO satellite uh, isn't in any way appropriate for the, the stock exchange uh, where they want uh, nanosecond timing uh, to, to, to put a timestamp on stock trades and things like that. So, so you know, as, as was kind of discussed, uh, Franklin's uh, uh, cold atom clock is probably a good fit for the uh, stock exchange kind of application. It's probably not a good fit for uh, GPS uh, satellites. Um, and and that goes on and on with a lot of different things. So so there is no simple answer. But I think from from our narrow point of view at FEI, uh, we we kind of focus on uh, a lot of military and space applications. And there, the, one of the problems with a lot of the advanced clocks is uh, that they're, they're, they're way too large and uh, they dissipate way too much power and uh, they can't handle the, the various kind of uh, rugged environments uh, that are needed. We, you know, for those applications, things need to work over a very wide temperature range, perhaps from minus 55 to uh, 85 degrees C. Uh, they need to, to be compact and uh, and not dissipate too much power, and so forth and so on. So uh, that's kind of our focus is is to get things that uh, that will work in those kind of environments. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, other applications. Right. So so for for some of these, you know, you were just mentioning, you know, these high G environments or or very, you know, low power consumption. So one of the great clocks that I think even John Kitching, uh, one of the panel members, um, John, if you're available, that'd be great. You know, so CSAC solved a lot of problems. Um, but but where where do we take CSAC from here to address some of these things? Is that possible? I, I would say that, um, you know, the main sort of directions right now in in sort of very, very compact clocks are um, improving performance, certainly, uh, without sacrificing uh, increased power consumption. Um, uh, and there are several efforts right now. Um, DARPA uh, is funding some of these to look at optical clocks uh, on a chip, basically. Um, there's, I would say, one of the other big uh, barriers to um, higher uh, use of chip scale clocks, especially in the military, is the cost. And so there are now programs and, and research efforts just uh, going, basically trying to get the clock cost down to $100 or something like that. Um, and, and, and my guess is that, you know, from a commercial perspective, I think probably cost is the biggest driver. Uh, and if we can get clocks down to you know much lower costs, it'll vastly uh, enhance the application space uh, and uh, the way in, ways in which they're used. I mean, I, you know, for chip scale clocks, they were mostly developed for the military. Um, but uh, in fact, the biggest application, at least of a, of a year, as of a year or two ago, is underwater timing for you know oil exploration. Um, and so uh, I think that is something that was really enabled mostly by the low power consumption of the clock, but I think low, lower cost really is something that would drive, I think, a huge number of applications, so. So it, it ended up, um, it was developed for DOD, but essentially it has three times the market outside of DOD, but that wasn't known until it came out, right? That's, that's, yeah. Yeah, which that's sort of a, a black swan effect, right? We don't really know that until it until it's there. Um, you know, another quick, thanks, thanks, John, that was very helpful. Um, so I want to go back to Chad. Chad, you had a, a image on your, one of your slides. Um, you had a CSAC clock um, on there. Does Honeywell make a CSAC clock? So Honeywell has been active, like I, I noted, for a couple of decades now and mostly uh, externally funded 
uh, DOD funded uh, miniature clock uh, technology development efforts, and uh, we put our own money behind it as well. Currently, uh, we don't have, uh, we're not marketing any clock modules, um, but uh, we continue to develop um, clocks of many different performance uh, echelons um, to this day, and we'll continue to. Great, great. So, so from a user's perspective and from a market perspective, um, Chad first, and then maybe Tom, um, are you, are, are, is Lockheed and, and Honeywell looking to partner with clock manufacturers or component makers in the future? Uh, I mean, I, I can, I mean, I, I don't uh, have control over uh, the product lines that might make best use of of clocks, um, I'm just a clock scientist, um, but I can say that um, the um, availability of high reliability, low cost, to echo a comment that's been made uh, multiple times, uh, autonomous timing uh, is something that, you know, if we put it into systems that, that Honeywell does sell, for example, the navigation uh, boxes that I showed on one of my intro slides, uh, I'm sure that there is uh, that that's value added to some customers. Um, the the trick, of course, is uh, if the component costs a substantial f fraction of the system, then uh, then you have to convince your customer that they need that timing. And as Franklin put it, um, it might take a crisis before uh, people realize uh, that uh, loss of precision timing, you know, hits the bottom line. Um, so uh, a long way of saying, sure, um, you know, it it. it any, any uh, new uh, clocks that, that meet the criteria, like I said, of ro a robustness operation over harsh environments and, and especially low cost, um, those are, are, are ripe for uh, adding uh, capabilities and adding value to the systems that we sell. Great, and Tom? Yeah, and I so I think those kinds of teamings can be a very powerful, um, partially because you know, Lockheed is not super great at innovating new widgets per se, but is very good at engineering those widgets for harsh environments and for operation on DOD relevant platforms. And, you know, has a very good understanding of how to interface with those customers and, you know, how do you do requirement uh, validation and tracking and so on, you know, like making it look like something they're uh, familiar with seeing. And so, I, you know, if you take this sort of strength, say, of the Lockheed organization and team that with, you know, uh, people are very good at uh, developing new clocks and so on. That's a pretty powerful uh, teaming and a great way to sort of mature that technology for the future. Great, great. Thank you. I'm just going to go back up because there's a lot of questions on market in the chat. Um, we focused a bit on, on GPS denied because it is a very hot area, um, you know, but but going back, you know, I think just in terms of some, some questions in the, in the chat about uh, telecom markets, about servers, about, you know, other devices using more accurate clocks, uh, you know, and, and, you know, looking at, you know, I, I, I put a snapshot here of today's dollars, um, you know, but this doesn't, this doesn't include speculation in, in the market in terms of like next generation quantum or black swan effects, like, you know, with the, a bad day in London on the stock exchange is all of a sudden going to release funding to you know push next generation clocks. But as John Kitching pointed out, you know CSAC started out as DoD and it went to uh, it, it actually has a much larger market uh, outside of DoD. And um, you know I don't know if anybody on this panel has the the background or expertise, but I would like to pose it out there. You know any thoughts on any of this making it into IoT or or uh, other consumer electronics areas, you know, down here, timing devices, there's about $5.4 billion and 2021 dollars sold into, me you know, MEMS and crystal quartz oscillators just sold into smartphones and various devices today, right? But uh, does anybody see, um, you know, so John, you know, you, you brought up the $100 atomic clock. Um, any ideas where those would go? Ah, uh, well, um, you know, I think I think ultimately, as the cost of, of, of atomic clocks gets lower, they would start to displace some of those sort of high end quartz oscillator, um, you know, uh, uh, quartz oscillators in various applications. Um, the one thing I, I kind of did also want to maybe point out about about CSAC is, 
Uh, and, and this really hasn't been taken advantage of too much in the current um, kind of realizations of the device, but the whole thing was sort of designed in order to be fabricated um, you know, in large wafers, essentially, you know, very much the way that the integrated circuits are made. And, you know, I don't think that the research community and the commercial community has really realized that at this stage, but if we can get to that point, right, if you can imagine now atomic clocks that could be, uh, could be fabricated, you know, on wafers, uh, you know, a thousand at a time, uh, and that, that's not out of the, 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 the range of possibility here. It's still a long way to go there. Um, but then I think you really potentially have, you know, atomic, atomically precise timing in, you know, um, consumer devices or, or uh, you know, and, 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 you know, once you get there, I think it's almost the, the sky's the limit, right, in terms of market. Yeah. Um, so, but that is down the road and, and there's a long way to go to get there. But I think that it is within, within reach. Great. Any, anybody else would care to comment? I guess I would just agree with that, that if you can hit those kinds of price points while retaining that performance, that would open up a huge market. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, with that, um, I, I think we're, we're wrapped up. Uh, Celia, you want to have any uh, closing thoughts? I just will thank everyone uh, once again for participating in another lively discussion with a lot of uh, chat uh, going on. And um, this is really, I think, useful to um, the, the broader community. Hopefully we'll help connect some of the members to uh, partners and customers and others um, in the community. Um, I'll uh, sort of offer um, that QEDC can be part of the solution. We've heard a lot of interesting um, sort of explanations about where the needs are, where opportunities lie, the trade-offs that are made, and um, there likely are areas for advancing sort of earlier stage capabilities that would benefit the community uh, broadly. And that's a, a role and a sort of niche where QEDC can help play a role. So um, just another sort of explanation of how all of this, these parts of the ecosystem fit together. So with that, um, I want to thank all of our speakers and everyone who joined us today. And um, feel free to share information about the quantum marketplace with your networks. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next month. And Mark, did you, I uh, want to remind folks what the upcoming event will be. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, you know, so the next month we're, we're doing uh, fabrication services. Uh, then we're going to be moving into electronics and RF um, for the actual electronics that go behind some of these quantum systems. And then we're going to be uh, skipping December uh, and we're going to go to January and we're going to do test and measurement. And then we're starting to think about doing quantum computing and quantum soft, quantum computing software. Uh, February through April. Um, and then some of these topics, you know, we, we've had, uh, we're, we're actually, so just everybody knows, um, we're working to get through as many of the membership as possible, rather than having the same companies present again and again. Some of the companies could have presented today, for example, but they already presented before. So, so if you feel that you have a, a topic that, that is, you know, timely, and we can get enough others to join, uh, you know, we're all here. It's just please send us a note. That's it. Thank you.